Two weeks ago, I released my first Cosmo comments video and it did very well. So I asked you, the viewers, to once again comment your questions, reactions, hot takes, etc. about the 2022 Nippon Professional Baseball League season for me to talk about. Apologies, I can't get to all of them, but thank you for all the support and the engagement. I hope you continue to like this series. And getting us started, free agency takes too long, 9 years. Players like Kodai Senga have to wait until free agency as the SoftBank Hawks never post their players, and by that point the player will be reaching the point where it will be really difficult to get acclimated to the playing environment of MLB. I definitely think that there should be a happy medium between Japanese players having more control over their own futures, while still ensuring that MPB teams can keep their best players for a decent amount of time. Famously, the Tazawa rule was finally scrapped in 2020. It effectively prevented amateur players in Japan from immediately making the jump to Major League Baseball. That's one reason that Shohei Otani decided against signing with an MLB org straight out of high school. There is just too much risk involved, but of course, even if you allow MPB players to freely go to MLB as they please, it's not like every single star is going to make that trip across the Pacific. In fact, a lot of Japanese stars would much prefer to just stay home in their country. So, in my opinion, the posting system needs some reform, but it generally serves its purpose. It allows MPB players to go to MLB before they hit free agency, while financially incentivizing clubs to actually go ahead and post their players. But then of course, there is flaws with this because rich teams like the SoftBank Hawks or Yomiuri Giants are rarely, if ever, going to post anyone. Kodai Senga, as the comment mentions, is the perfect example. The Hawks have not respected his wishes to get posted despite his long service time. So maybe reducing the international free agent period from 9 years to 6 or 7 years would be a good place to begin. Next up, with Freddie Galvis being demoted to the second team after such an explosive debut with a Grand Slam, will he adjust and return to play on the first team again, or will he be on the ever-expanding list of failed gaijins that people thought are gonna rake in Japan? Galvis has definitely looked pretty bad in his first month of MPB play, hitting 129, 228, 186, and his only real highlight was the go-ahead Grand Slam in the very first game of the season. Of course, he's been great defensively, but you just can't hit like that and expect not to get demoted. Now, Galvis never posted an OPS plus above 100 in any season throughout his MLB career, but he was always a pretty solid bat with some sneaky pop. So while I didn't expect him to destroy the competition in Japan, I certainly thought he would be a good contributor. To be fair, his batting average on balls in play is 148, so getting quite unlucky at times there, and his strikeout to walk ratio is not horrible. So maybe if Galvis finds his stroke again on the farm team, then he can return and make an impact on the first team, but even if he does, I still see him as a defense first player with the ability to run into a home run occasionally. Next comment, hot take, MPB should purchase the Indie Leagues. BCL plus one of NOL or SILP to become a pre-made tier in their developmental system. Yomiuri and SoftBank shouldn't be the only ones running a Sangun club. This would definitely be a groundbreaking move. Most MPB organizations only have a first team and a second team that play organized games, but the richer clubs like the Giants and Hawks do run a third team as well. And they already play games against the Indy League teams. So it wouldn't be totally out of left field if MPB just buys those leagues to form more of a structured minor league system for all 12 teams out of it. Of course, I'd hope that the independent leagues, which would no longer be independent at that point, still get to have some level of autonomy, and I'm not sure if the logistics will ever allow this to happen, but it certainly is an interesting idea to throw around. Okay, next up, what is the data telling us about overall offensive production as we enter the month of May? Well, hitting across both the Pacific and Central Leagues is gradually increasing, but runs are still very, very hard to come by. The Pacific League in particular this season is unreal. The league batting average is 230, the league OPS is 633, and the league isolated power is 102. Teams are also striking out a little bit more, but not all that much. So the issue clearly stems from the dead balls. They just aren't traveling enough, and a lot of batted balls in the air are getting caught. Of course, this doesn't apply to everyone. The SoftBank Hawks are doing just fine with a 263 team average and a 708 team OPS, 
and the same goes for the Giants in the Central League with a 251 average and 729 OPS. But overall, the lack of hitting is forcing teams to adapt by playing even more small ball. Stolen bases are up across the board. The Lotte Marines, for instance, have taken 35 bags in just 29 games. That puts them on pace for 173 steals at year's end, over 50 more than the league leader last season. So hopefully we do start to see more extra base hits as the year goes on, but right now it's definitely looking like a pitcher's paradise. Next up, I'll put these two comments together. Considering how good the Rocket and Eagles are performing right now, they could be good contenders for the Pacific League pennant. And the Eagles are the best team in MPB and will run away with the PL pennant. Yeah, as of right now, it's pretty difficult to make a case that the Eagles are not the best team in Japan. They're 19-6-1, four games ahead of the second place Hawks and seven games ahead of the third place Lions. And I would say they're pretty much a lock to finish in the top two in the league by the end of the year. But I won't say that they're going to run away with the pennant. Back in 2020, the Hawks won the pennant by 14 games over the Marines, and it is totally possible the Eagles are just that much better than everyone this season. But as long as the Hawks exist, I don't think the Eagles are going to win the pennant by any more than four or five games. In fact, I still think the Hawks have a pretty good chance of flying past the Eagles at some point in the season. I like the Eagles starting rotation more, and I think their bullpens are pretty evenly matched, but I like the Hawks offense more. Also, Rakuten has only committed 4 errors this season in 26 games. To put that into perspective, SoftBank has committed 14 errors in 30 games, and Cebu has committed 21 errors in 31 games. Of course, one can just attribute that to the Eagles having superb defense, and maybe that's true, but there's also some luck involved, and the fact that they've only given up Three unearned runs all year is just not totally sustainable. So while I fully expect the Eagles to make a strong run for the pennant, I'm not quite ready to say that they're going to run away with it. Moving on, despite the struggles of the Bay Stars and Tigers, I still see the Central League as wide open. The best teams have issues and the worst teams still have strong aspects to them that could carry them. With PL, it's pretty clear that the Hawks are back with a vengeance. Yeah, I totally agree. The Pacific League, as I just talked about, is looking like a two-way race between the Eagles and Hawks, but the Central League is still up in the air. The Yomiuri Giants are the clear favorites at this point, and they've looked really strong, but we saw last year how they can just totally collapse at the end of the year. And I still think the Yoko Swallows are just as good as them. They're only a game and a half back of the Giants at this point, but they've been missing several key players. But then after that, I really have no idea what team is going to snatch the last playoff spot. It's looking like the Hiroshima Carp right now, but I'm not totally sold on their pitching or their hitting for that matter. And then there's the Chunichi Dragons. Their offense has looked much better than last year, but is that really sustainable? It's certainly not on the level of the teams above them. And then the DNA Bay Stars and Hanshin Tigers are off to slow starts, but I still think they're better than the record shows. We haven't really seen the Bay Stars offense at full strength yet, and their pitching, at least peripherally, is much improved from last year, so I don't put it past them to get hot and make a run. Now, as for the Tigers, they may have just put themselves in too much of a hole to begin the season. We have another comment here, the Hanshin Tigers are going to come all the way back to squeak into the playoffs, led by Teruaki Sato's first of many MVPs but I just don't think that's very likely. They're 12 games under 500, and the fact that they just recently won six games in a row and are still this far behind the pack says to me that you can all but write them off this season. So I think the Tokyo teams are the obvious front runners, but everything is still up for grabs. And then let's wrap things up here with a few rapid fire questions. Do you think Miyagi and Kuribayashi can overcome the second year slump? I don't know if they can, but the Orcs Buffaloes definitely need them too. Miyagi's velocity has been down in the early going, and that's a concern, but I think he'll eventually figure it out. But they're putting an awful lot of pressure on Kuribayashi to perform. He's only 20 years old, and they've stuck him right in the heart of the order, expecting him to immediately turn into a Hayato Sakamoto type player. It's a lot of pressure, and while I think he's done an admirable job of manning the shortstop position at such a young age, I don't think the offensive skills are quite there yet. He should realistically be hitting 7th or 8th in the lineup, as he did for most of last season, not hitting 3rd as the premier run producer outside of Masataka Yoshida. Do you ever see MPB trying to do more with younger foreigners like Carter Stewart? Maybe. I thought there was a chance with Kumar Rocker, as he's a Boris client like Stewart and didn't sign after being drafted last season, but things just didn't work out there. But I really think a lot of this depends on how Stewart does. 
If he ends up having a nice MPB career and then heads over to MLB after that and makes a name for himself, then a lot of young Americans are going to be intrigued by that, especially considering how bad minor league conditions can be, and MPB teams are going to be intrigued by that too. And in the case of Latin players, we're already seeing teams like the Giants be aggressive in signing young 16-year-olds out of the Dominican Republic, which is good because it's going to get young athletes paid more with additional competition among clubs. I have heard Egawa talking about the difference of Radar Gun back then and now. Many MPB legends seem to argue that the Radar Gun nowadays is faster than those before the 2000s. Maybe you can talk about it. Look, I've done zero research on this and I guess it's totally possible, but I feel like MLB Network has done this exact same segment where retired players claim the modern players are not actually as good as they believe. And they use old footage to try to prove this with the velocity, but to me it's pretty obvious that guys are throwing harder now than ever before, and they're going to continue to do that. That's just the evolution of sports science. And then last one for today, is there a possibility in the future of MPB being more easily accessible for people living in America? Unfortunately, probably not, because first off, the Pacific League and Central League are not even united, and then second off, I haven't seen any indication that MPB cares about a foreign audience. Otherwise, they should have been jumping at the opportunity to get the North American market during the pandemic season as the KBO did. All right, now sorry I couldn't get to all of them, but I hope you enjoyed Cosmo Comments number two. And special thanks to my patrons, Chris J, Jonathan Greenberg, Hinosato Yaku, Poker Pack Rat, Corgi Racing, Anthony Pang, Jake Royce, Marcus Hill, Yua Bird, Ryan Fox, Jeff W. Sharaznable, Juan Jose Sanchez, Bracamontes, Christopher Woods, Samantha Garavay, Yuki Samarine, Kud, Jem Morelos, Gabriel Foss, Kurt Berglund, Eduardo Granados, Kotaro Imahayashi Kim, J1, Tom Musa, Mike Braun, Lucas Bora, and Stu22. If you'd like to become a patron yourself, please check out patreon.com slash baseballcosmo. Thanks for watching, please like and subscribe for more MPB content in English.